You're listening to Worshipology with Curtis Parks, a biblical, practical, and spiritual conversation about leading and living worship. This episode is brought to you by Waves. Waves Custom IEMs makes affordable, custom-fitted in-ear monitors using high-end, balanced armature drivers. Choose your design or create your own and scan your ears from your phone at home. Go to wavescustom.com, that is W-A-V-S-C-U-S-T-O-M.com, and use the code WORSHIPOLOGY for a special discount today. Now, lean in and enjoy today's episode. Well, hey, thanks so much for listening to the Worshipology Podcast. This is a conversation that's biblical, practical, and spiritual. It's all about living and leading worship. And today, uh, man, I think I met Brett, we, we met like when I first moved to Nashville in 2017, right? Yep. Yeah, we, we, I think we got some coffee. We've written together. We actually did a camp together, um, <laughs> and you brought out the coolest crew of guys. Do you remember that? Oh, I absolutely remember that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we ate a lot of good food, though. That was good. We ate good food, and we still share uh, some videos from that time. Oh, snap. Watch out. <laughs> Brett, Brett, we got <laughs> Brett Perkins. Brett Perkins is the uh, worship pastor at the Journey Church at uh, Lebanon, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville. Brett, dude, say what's up to Worshipology, man. What's up, everybody? Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm Brett Perkins, and I'm a worship pastor outside of Nashville in Lebanon, Tennessee at the Journey Church. It, it almost sounds like you're, you're making a confessional, like, my name is Brett <laughs> I am a worship pastor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to trying to get it all. I'm a husband. I'm a dad. I have four kids, all boys, all Love under it. the age of eight. So somebody Snap. pray for me, as oh my gosh, as, uh, one artist would say. <laughs> Dude, that's a lot, man. That's a lot. Well, I love I love seeing you on Instagram, man, because you are a true family man. You can tell you love your your wife and your kids, and that's awesome to see. Yeah. And uh, man. We've been friends for a little while now. It's so exciting to get you on the podcast, bro. Just for our listeners, man, why don't you just share a little bit of your story? Like, how did you get started in in music and, and now as a worship pastor? Um, I know you guys are writing songs and releasing projects. It's amazing. We're going to get into all that. But, dude, how did you get your start in this whole thing, Brett? Yeah, I'll try to be as condensed as possible. I was 15 when I first uh, sensed a call to be a worship leader. I was at a... Wow. I was at a conference. There was this pastor that walked out onto the stage. He was about to preach, and his prayer was, your will, nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. That was it. Wow, that's and so And then he went into his, his message, and I just remember writing that down in my little notebook and time stamped mm. it uh, because I knew that that wasn't the prayer of my own life. There were more mm. people at this event than were in my hometown. I, was, I grew up in a really small town in West Tennessee, Greenfield, Tennessee. We had 2,300 people, four square miles, a red light, and a Sonic. That's what we, <laughs> that's what we grew up with. Uh, and At so least you had a Sonic. <laughs> we, we had a Sonic. We now have a, we have a McDonald's now, which is great. But That's awesome. Uh, there was no reason for me to really believe that uh, God was calling me to anything like this, just because in, mm. in West Tennessee, like your worship leaders were not even bivocational. They weren't even, they were volunteers at churches. So for me to think yeah. about like a life of doing this, I just didn't know really what that looked like. Um, but I sensed a call then as if the Lord was saying, like, you're going to do this one day. Wow. And um, on my way home from that event, my student pastor, I hadn't shared that with anybody. And my student pastor came up and was like, hey, I want to start building a, a youth worship team uh, would you be interested? Because he knew I was a closet guitar player. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't really talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. And so he asked me, freaked me out. I said no. Uh, so I ran from it, and uh, it took me about four to six months to, to get around to play. And, and then I finally said yes, and pretty quickly after I said yes, he resigned. And so oh, wow. I became the worship leader for the student ministry at age 16. <laughs> Wow. And so it all kind of fell in my lap at that point, and I ran from it for a little bit. Like I, I ended up going, I, I, I was consistent with my student ministry, but then when I got to college, I wanted to be a baseball player, so I, I became a baseball player in college. Wow, wow. Um, and when I got there, I was pretty miserable because I knew I was running from what God had called me to. Mm. So one weekend I went home, 
uh, just miserable. And I found a stack of books, and in that stack of books was a journal. I opened up the journal at age 18, and I saw my 15-year-old handwriting Wow. that said, your will, nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. And it mm. was that day that I turned the page and was like, okay, I don't know what this looks like, but Lord, wow. may your will be done. And so I, I quit baseball, pursued worship in the church, and I haven't really looked back since. I was, I was wow. 18 then. So that's what got me into music, church, worship, uh, writing kind of was a part of that journey as well. I just wanted yeah. to write scripture to learn it, uh, honestly, just, just as a way of memorization. Um, but then over time, I got inspired just to write for the church. And uh, mm. so fast forward to today, we're writing songs for the church in my local church here in Lebanon. That's amazing. Dude, talk to me a little bit about the culture at Journey Church, because um it seems like it's a little bit newer in the scope of things as a church plant. And it's just uh, really blown up and people are connecting with it. And talk yeah. to us, like how, how did the church start? How did you get involved with journey church and what's the culture like that makes journey church so unique? Yeah. Uh, man, I, I could talk the rest of the time about this. <laughs> so that's a, that's <laughs> a loaded it, question. I love my yeah. church so much um our Mm. pastor eric reed he started it just in a home um 18 years ago and it was out of this conviction for i I think he was he was a uh leading young adults at the time Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it was just out of this conviction for biblical uh literacy biblical community um back to the bible let's get back to the bible let's teach people how to uh understand scripture in the midst of their circumstances good or bad um mm. how is how is god still good in in difficult seasons how is god still better in great seasons you know like mm. how how do we pursue jesus through all we just believe that jesus uh every life would be better if jesus were the center and we believe that uh the local church is the hope of the world when jesus is the center so how do we build a culture around that and so wow. now 18 years later, um, I'm here. I've been here for eight and a half years. Eric and I actually met on the road uh, at a fuge camp down in uh, Florida. We did a camp together. Mm -hmm. I was in a season of just needing a leader in my life, and uh, they happened to uh, just part ways with their worship leader at the time. Mm -hmm. And so they had a vacancy, and I had a vacancy, and... uh, (laughs) Over over the next couple of years, we formed a relationship, and it and it felt like a really good fit for me to come here and learn uh, under him. And wow. um, so, yeah, we've been we've been doing this together. Our staff has grown a ton. We've got an incredible staff. The culture here is very much uh, just uh, it's gospel centered. It's great commission, ambition. It's pompous, free, realness. Um, Love it. We. This is we we talk about this internally. This is where big dillness comes to die. <laughs> we Dude, we just we so good. we celebrate, we collaborate. Um, you know, we we don't compete. If we're competing, we're trying to outdo one another in, um, mm. you know, in in serving, not in uh, what what's seen in the sense of uh, notoriety sake. And so wow. Um, which is a big deal because people may not realize like Lebanon is literally just outside of Nashville. It like, is. You guys are adjacent to Music City. We, we, so that's why it's so huge. Yeah. And we also, we just found out, uh, it was like a month ago or something, this study came out. I think Lebanon's like the 12th fastest growing city in America. Wow. That doesn't so surprise me. Yeah. We have a lot of transplants, a lot of people from California, um, a, mm-hmm. lot of, a lot of political refugees come out here uh wow. <laughs> wow. that's that's a political statement sorry <laughs> uh, we're, we're too close we're, we're too close to the election <laughs> man yeah um we uh but yeah there's a lot of people who come out here um and they're they're moving here you know just for for one thing or another right um, right and which so much opportunity just it, to reach people where they're at yeah it's a lot of opportunity and the church is 
growing and people have asked like what are you doing and honestly man we're we're literally just reading scripture i think there's such a hunger wow for truth today and um mm. you know you i think some believe that the golden ticket is um maybe gimmicks or maybe you you have something cool to offer or you know gospel plus whatever mm-hmm. but man people just want to know what the truth is and wow. at, at least around here and so yeah. we're trying to address cultural issues we want to be able to equip our people in a culture of lies we want we want our people to be equipped to fight the culture with the truth of the gospel Dude, that's so and, good. Uh, now, now talk to me. How, how does that inspire the way that you guys write? Are you guys, you know, taking basically sermon notes and just turning it into lyric fuel? Are you guys like matching up on the scripture points? Like when you're doing a project and I would imagine hold the line. I mean, that's a pretty bold statement, even in a title. Yeah. Like maybe talk a little bit about the, the message behind that song, but just in general, like how do you guys approach songwriting with that heart to teach the truth? Yeah, I think Hold the Line is a good example. I mean, we've told people that Hold the Line is kind of, it's the, it's really like our mission statement as a band and as a church. I mean, Eric, uh, a few years ago, wrote wrote a book called Hold the Line, where it was addressing that issue, Um, Mm. fighting the lies of the culture with the truth of the gospel, holding the line uh, amidst resistance, really, to the gospel. And, um, so it's kind of a military type term. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we'll take notes during sermon notes. I I get Eric's manuscript every Wednesday, uh, typically on good weeks. We, I get it on Wednesdays, uh, (laughs) but I have, I have a backlog of all of his messages. And if there's ever anything that like just stands out, Mm. then we'll, we'll kind of note that. Um, and then even Eric has, has been very open to writing with us as well. So like cool. it, within a writing culture, some people have asked like, what, what do you think is something that we could do differently, uh, to maybe guard the theology of our songs? And I would say, include your pastor. And wow. I, that's such a, uh, it, it's funny how yeah. many people are like, oh dude, I can't, he's so not creative or like, I'm not going <laughs> to do that. But here's what happened, man. I started, I actually, that was one of the markers at the very beginning of our writing. We, we sensed in 2020, just to give you like a, an idea of where Journey Worship Co. was conceived and why. Um, in 2020, I'd been traveling by myself, uh, or as myself for about 10 years. And I'd Mm -hmm. been really wanting to merge what I was doing on the road with, uh, the church. And when 2020 happened, everything shut down, um, and it gave us a really good time to just assess what are we doing, what what kind of resources are we are resourcing our people, how are we equipping them in the in the you know state of the world right now. And I sent I saw this like unfortunate trend. I noted it. I I I don't know if anyone else. I mean, I'm sure there have been others, but. It, yep. For me, for me, this trend of worship where songs that were resourced in the church um, were sacrificing content at the altar of creativity, wow. generally. So you had these really creative songs that the label would then get behind and put into the inbox of worship leaders across the country. And then worship leaders were just devouring it because they were like, oh, well, if the label sends it to me, this must be hot. Wow. And so they do it and you sent you see this reality that churches don't have a hunger problem, they have an appetite problem. <laughs> Dude. So they're they're eating whatever's in front of them. They needed wow. their appetites to be shaped towards something different. Mm. And so we just that's where we started like really feeling the conviction of okay, if we're going to if we're going to do this to meet a need, we see a need. And even if nobody else sings these songs, our people wow. will be served by it. So that's when we started writing. And all of those convictions led to then the the process of like, okay, what are what are sermons that are coming? What are sermons that have been um preached recently? Um 
Eric says this. He's our our pastor, Eric Reed. He says this a lot. Um, I don't think it's unique to him, but I'm going to give him credit. I think after you, if you use it once, you give it to somebody else. You use it a second <laughs> time, you forget, and then the third time it's yours. And I've heard him I say it more than three that. times. Yep. So it's his at this point. Um, That's good. And he said, uh, he said, songs are just sermons that people remember. And wow. Uh, that's coming from the pastor, you know? So, um, yeah. so how do we, how do we take songs? How do we take sermons that connected to us and make them memorable? Well, you put a melody to them. That's it. And so, uh, we take sermons, we take scriptures, catechisms, creeds. We pull pastors into the room to give us guardrails on like making sure that it's, uh, truthful and clear and accurate to scripture. And then we mm. have our, we have our creatives, come around and make it into a song. And the coolest thing has been how our my team has been discipled directly by all the pastors that have been involved because they're sitting in a room with a pastor for three hours just so trying good. to articulate the Word of God better. So mm. it makes the songs richer. It makes the team stronger. Um, it, it, give, it edifies the body because it gives them a song that is a sermon that they can then remember and recite throughout the week because it's connected to a melody. That's so good, man. I I love what you just said in there because it really seems like, you know, there's this ultimate collaboration in the staff of your church to, to resource your church first and then anything else that comes out of that is just a blessing. But the fact is like, you're right. I mean, there's so many songs being released and yeah, it almost seems like there's there's a, a fight for like the most creative idea. But yeah. at the end of the day, as the people of God, we need to be armed with the Word of God. Yes, and and I, I just love that that's the primary focus of Journey Worship is like, man, we want to turn these sermons into songs. We want. I always had this thing that I would teach our worship team is music plus message equals memory. Yeah. And there, there's something that, I mean, we remember that from when we were kids. I mean, every kid learns the ABCs to a song. Every kid learns the capitals to a song. And um, I think there's something so key about that. Talk to me a little bit about, I mean, I, I, it's so cool to just hear every time you've referenced your pastor, Eric, like you can just tell that there's a camaraderie, there's a friendship, there's a mutual respect there. Like, what do you guys do to foster that relationship between lead pastor and worship pastor to where you guys really are in sync and just locked arm in arm? Yeah. Um, I mean, he's, he's a buddy. So when I first got here, um, he told me, I can't, he said, I can't teach you how to play guitar. I can't teach you how to sing. I can't teach you how to lead a band, <laughs> but I can teach you leadership and I can teach you theology. Wow. I can teach you how to articulate the things of God. And so wow. for the first six months here at the church, uh, almost every week, he sat me in front of a whiteboard, and he became a seminary professor for me. I mean, he, he would answer questions that I had. He was giving me books to read and to learn. I mean, I was, I was discipled and, and shaped into a pastor by Eric Reed. <laughs> wow. And, and I think that, that I think that's one, one of the real distinguishing differences um, that I've seen a lot of, I think a lot of churches hire talented people, but they don't give them a space to grow theologically. Like there, there's mm. a, there's a job description and I see them. I know it's out there. There's job descriptions for worship leaders who, um, are talented. They have experience leading the band. They know how to run pro presenter and, uh, general things on Ableton, but there's really not a whole lot about biblical literacy yeah, and then there's no space to grow outside of uh, telling them that you'll uh, fund seminary for them. Right, right. And and not every worship leader uh, feels called to the seminary, but mm. they but they could certainly grow from personal discipleship from their pastor. And mm -hmm. I'm a I'm a product of that. Um, mm. And so I think that being kind of a foundation of our relationship when I first got here. It just grew my my respect for him and my uh, appreciation for him. That yeah. that then became really the building, like the foundation that everything else has been built on. And um, so, whenever he offers a suggestion, I don't receive it as I'm doing bad. I receive it as he wants the best for me and the best for our church. 
Wow. And uh, and I think that's really important. Like, there's a lot of worship leaders out there who don't have a really good relationship with their pastor. So anytime he suggests something, they just assume that like he's against them or yeah, um, that's true. He has an opinion that's negative about the way that they do things. But the reality is like the pastor's the leader of the church. We, we're elder led, so it's not that he's like the buck stops, you know, tyrant. Mm. Um, but uh, I was talking to one worship pastor who had been with um, a, a guy who, he was a speaker that, well, I'll just, it, this guy was Piper's worship leader for like 25 years. I talked to him. Mm-hmm. I was trying to figure mm-hmm. out how to like say that in a different <laughs> way, but this is the guy. <laughs> this and is the only way I can do it. There's the only way. And he's, and um, I met with him because I'm like, I want to, I want to know like one, dude, you, you had longevity with a guy who. Yeah. Everybody wanted at their church. And I, and I, I mean, I think, I think highly of Eric and, you know, I just, I wanted to, I think there was some correlations here. And he said, just remember this as a worship leader, there's only one prophet at your church and it's not you. Wow. And I think some, some worship leaders can get to a place where like they want to take the church one place and their pastor doesn't. And so then there's two Mm. visions and when there's yeah. when there's two visions, that's literally the definition of division. Wow. And if you're leading from the top with two visions, then you're never aligned. And so I try to be honestly, I try to be the one that initiates like, hey, let's go to lunch, let's get let's talk. Let's go hang out and not talk about church. Let's go mm. just like let's talk about family and let's yeah. um let's try to be on the same page in that sense. And then like keeping up throughout the week. Uh, whether it's via text, I mean, we're both, he and I are both busy, so we don't get to see each other physically every week, but staying in touch in that sense and trying to foster uh, a collaborative week each week, uh, Mm. I think is helpful. But having that foundation of trust, I think is the huge part. That is key, man, because I mean, and you you hit it on the head and, and truth be told, I think all of us at some point have kind of probably whenever we hear not criticism, but really constructive feedback in order to build us up, we, th- we take it as an attack and it's like, we go into the defense mode of like, yeah. well, man, they just didn't appreciate all I'm bringing to the table. But I-, I realized something years ago, Brett, is that, you know, a lead pastor is like, it's really that chief cultural engineer, right? It's like th- th- they're shepherds of the culture of a church. And, you know, they were mo- most lead pastors were there before the worship pastor got there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so it's like, man, if they brought you on, they clearly believe in you. They clearly see so much potential. Um, and, and the affirmation is there just from that. But to be in a learning posture of like, man, I want to lead this church in the way that God is really like brought leadership into this church. Like I want to, if, if there's leadership, I want to follow and I want to be, in sync with that. I want to steward the move that I've been given charge over, but it's really under the leadership of the lead pastor. And I think it's so key that if you can build that trust and if you can find that trust and cultivate that, like by going out of your way, like, Hey, let's go grab lunch. Let's go grab coffee and just be in the same room. Yeah. Um, you know, because like I heard a phrase a long time ago that distance demonizes. And so, yeah, you know, if you're not hanging out, if you're not getting in the same spaces in the same room, if you're not building relationship, it's so easy to make up your own narrative. And oftentimes if the enemy creeps in or anything gets in our head, it's like, man, you know, so-and-so is not for me or so-and-so hasn't said, man, worship was, was incredible this morning. And you really start to make it about yourself. Yeah. And, and, and let's talk about this for a minute, because what is when, when somebody says, oh, man, worship was incredible this morning. Let's be honest. They're probably saying like, man, the band didn't mess up <laughs> or, or man, the sound didn't have any feedback issues or, you know, it's like because and our, our pastor was actually just preaching a message about this. And he said, you know, he was like, when 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 worship is awesome, it's really a reflection on the condition of our heart and not how good the band sounded. Yeah. It's like if if you were to say, man, worship was amazing this morning, what you really ought to be thinking is that, man, my heart was so open to the things of God. I was in full surrender. I was all about Jesus, all of my attention, all of my affection on him. Um what do you, as worship leaders, how do we cultivate that atmosphere where it does become less about us and more about people experiencing the goodness of God? I mean, obviously, like excellence plays a part of that, but is there is there more to it, Brett? Yeah, I 
that's such an interesting comment to receive um because i i i mean i kind of know what they mean but i never yeah. really know what they mean <laughs> and right? so because of that i just i try to i try to just believe like they mean it as a compliment they don't know how to say it and mm. so i'll just say thank you and i'll i'll move on yeah. but i don't but i don't linger on it like i don't Man, I think sometimes compliments can linger, and if compliments linger, then so can critiques. Wow! And you just gotta, you gotta receive. You know, especially uh, working at a church. Like, if there's a compliment, you better believe somebody else has an opinion that's gonna contradict that compliment about five wow. minutes later. <laughs> and so you're right. So I think I think as far as like cultivating uh, a culture of worship, it has to start internally. Yeah. And your yeah. leader, your leader really determines the culture. Like mm. um if if you're if someone's listening who's a new uh worship leader at a church, maybe you're not leading in the culture that you created yet. But in 3 years, I've always heard it takes about 3 years to create a culture. After yep. about 3 years, you're living in the culture you created. Whether wow. you like it or not. Good or bad, exactly. <laughs> Good or bad. You look around, you've either enabled it or you've let it to become that intentionally. Wow. And um and I think it has to start internally. So like having a value system of who you are and who you who you want your church to be. Um mm. something I pray often is, God, would you make me a more accurate representative of your word? Mm. So that we collectively as a church will become more accurate responders to it. Wow. Um, which, means, good, which means I have to go to the scriptures daily and be moved by the scriptures and be committed to then share what moves me. That's good. As a worship pastor. And I think, but, but I have to have a high view of what my role is too. Like I, I actually, mm. I, I don't like when churches... Uh, don't establish a worship pastor because I think it is a pastoral position. And when you don't, when it's not functioning as a pastoral position, then I think that you're undercutting what actually is happening in the room. Wow. Um. You, but but in you know if if you were to call it a pastoral position and just operate in that sense, there's a there's an empowerment that comes with that, mm -hmm. and a new lens in which the leader is thinking through. Like I'm mm. fostering. A, I'm facilitating, I guess, um, an interaction with the people of God and the truth of God. That's what we're doing yeah. as worship leaders. Yeah. Um, and so as far as like cultivating the culture of response, I think it has to start internally. And then you've got to figure out how to codify that with your team and continue to find ways uh, to disciple your team even if it's just Sunday mornings before service, just like dig through the scriptures and find something, find a nugget just to yeah. remind your people and take five or 10 minutes to open the word with your own team, something that's mm. unique to them and say, this is a reality that you have in Christ. Wow. Go and be believable today. Mm. Just simple, simple stuff like that or just reminders of like, Man, what we're sharing today has been shared since Isaiah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it has worked since then. So wow. we can have faith to believe that it'll work today too. Wow. Um, and when, I mean, I think, I think some of the best compliments that we get that I receive as a leader is it just looks like you guys have so much fun together. Like y'all just that's, look that's like, good, yeah. you guys just look like you enjoy being around one another. And I love mm. it so much because... When I first got here, no one liked anybody, I don't think. <laughs> I, it was Wait, we're tough. all Christians, it, right? It was tough, man. Like it was a yeah. hard culture and uh, yeah. there was a lot of growth that needed to happen in my heart and then around the team. I don't know why. I remember I, talking to you right around that time. Yeah. Cuz yeah, cuz I around, think we met like 2016, 2017. And that was that was when it all kind of went down and I was just wow. like I mean, I legitimately wasn't sure how long I was going to be here because how, of how difficult the culture was. And wow. Um, but it required, it required some humility on my end to pursue people who weren't giving me a shot 
and I needed to take them to lunch and give them a chance to like me. And I needed to give myself a chance to like them too. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, um, so like there Bro, was, there, a- there's so much wisdom in what you just said though. Like, because I think we do live in a day and age where, Hey, when it gets rough, I'm out of here. Yeah. And the fact that you've got that stick to 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 see past your current frustration and realize maybe God's growing me and growing them. And now you guys are thriving in that environment, man. Yeah. I mean, that just says a lot to your leadership. Well, I think there's a persistence that's required uh, yeah. for leaders. If you want, um, I think it's, uh, who is it that says this? I don't remember exactly who says this, but if, if, you wanna, if you want people to like you, then go sell ice cream. Don't be a leader. <laughs> uh, but but in the church you're leading people and you and as a worship leader you're dealing with creatives so they're already yeah. a little bit emotional and unstable yeah, <laughs> and, yeah you're right and every idea is a uh, is a vulnerable idea that's connected to a soul because it's their creative lane of offering mm. you know and so yeah. you got to know how to navigate things um and just like i think there's just a persistence that's required uh but knowing I mean, for me early on, what kept me around is I could either, I'm either going to go and inherit someone else's issue uh, and live in their culture, or I'm going to stay around, figure out uh, something new about myself, and maybe everybody will benefit, even even me. Like, I'll, I'll grow wow. as a leader if I stick with this. I think God's, mm. he brought me here for a reason. I felt so called to this church and this, this town that yeah. I knew we were supposed to be here. I was miserable for a little bit. and mm. But then now on the other side of it, I, I tell people all the time, if I could take my staff hat off, this is the church that I want to be at. Like I, Wow. My family, th- these people have become family to me, and my family is better for it. We've, we've literally grown into a family here. We came here with no kids, and now we have four. Yeah. We've gone through tough seasons and our families far enough away that it had to be the church that held us up and wow and they've become that and so i've just my love for these people has grown so much we've done everything but buy a grave plot here and we plan on that uh, <laughs> when when that time happens but taking it to a morbid spin here yeah taking it to a morbid spin but but like we literally <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's that says so much though yeah that says so much about it yeah so that's incredible Dude, talk to me a little bit about like, you know, you said all four of your boys born since you guys have been a part of Journey Church. And that's just a beautiful story of like, literally you're raising your kids there. Like, I remember somebody once saying like, man, let's make this the church that we want our kids to raise their kids in. Yeah. And and there's just something about that longevity, that faithfulness, that's so kingdom. I mean, it really is all about the kingdom of God. It's that, that long I mean, uh, it was Charlie Hall in this last uh, podcast, he was saying, God loves to tell long stories. And and that just stuck with me because it's like, we live in a day and age where it's like, man, we're show, we're, we're, we're short-sighted, uh, we're short-minded, our attention spans are, are small. And I think that's played a little bit of a part into this willingness to jump ship when things get tough. Yeah. And how do you kind of make that resolve of like, you know what, when things get rough, this is where I'm going. This is what I'm doing to make sure that I don't jump ship. Is there, is there like a, a scripture you go to? Is there a, you know, return to your first love kind of thing that you go to, or is it just reminding yourself what you wrote in that journal when you were a teenager? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I haven't, I don't know. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, Mm. man, when, when things get hard, it's the first question is, okay, God, what are you doing? Yeah, that's good. And I think that's important because, like, I think he's sovereign over all things. I think he's sovereign Mm. over good and bad. Mm. And I think that he does unique things in the midst of suffering that he won't do outside of suffering. Wow. Like, in the strange kindness of God, he ordains suffering so that we might know his grace in a different way that we wouldn't know it in that particular way had that suffering not happened. Wow. And, uh, and I'm, that's a specific statement connected to a specific season of mine and Megan's life. We had two miscarriages in seven months, 
time frame mm. between uh, our third and our fourth kid. And that was a that was a tricky season uh, for us. But I mean, I, I think whether it's that or whether it's like team dysfunction and God teaching me that uh, in the midst of that, Jesus knew that Judas was betraying him, yet he washed his feet. Yeah. Uh, you know, like there's, <laughs> I think, I think sometimes we can be so nearsighted that we, we admire our own faith uh, to a detrimental degree. Like, wow. God, I, I can't believe that you would allow this to happen because I've been so faithful. Mm. But maybe, maybe your, your season has nothing to do with you. Maybe it has everything to do with what God's doing in you. Wow. Uh, maybe, maybe it's that God's teaching you something new, and, mm. uh, and then that will impact generations you know like i I just i think yeah yeah so so i think um my belief in the sovereignty of god over all things really then leads me to okay god i don't know what you're doing um but i trust you and i'm gonna i'm gonna sit in this and i'm gonna pay attention to this tension that i'm in Mm. and trust that uh inside the tension there's something being uh, molded. There's something that you're doing that's refining me and is going to give me a new lens uh, that I can look through that will then be helpful. Because I think if yeah. com- if comfort's involved, then, I mean, Scripture's clear, we're comforted to no comfort and then to show comfort. But there's, wow. so, many, there's so many of those things. Like, just as Paul said, we're, he, he was shown the mercies of God so that he might know the mercies of God and the then people will know the mercies right. of God. And that led him to worship. That led him mm. to sing, so to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Because he knew that his testimony was going to be helpful. Mm. And I think there, there's just, there's scripture time and time again. We see our eyes are unveiled to behold Christ for who he is. And as we behold him, we become more like him. We're transformed from one degree of glory to the next. And then right after that, it says, then you've been given the ministry of sight. Or, wow. um, that's so good. The, the old has passed away, the new has come. Now, as those who are reconciled, you carry the ministry of reconciliation. So, on, on behalf of Christ, as an ambassador of Christ, be reconciled to God. Like, you're, you're, you're comforted to comfort, you're, you're shown mercy to give mercy, you're, um, You've been given eyes to see for the ministry of sight. You've been reconciled to reconcile. Like, I just believe mm. God's doing something bigger than what we see often. Wow. That's so true, man. Uh, I'm just still kind of chewing on that phrase, the strange kindness of God. Yeah. Be- because, I mean, and and all of us, I believe, have walked through seasons of suffering and seasons of just like questioning, like, God, where are you in the midst of this? And then w- when you go through the other side, you're like, man, I never would have known you're this good had I not gone through that bad. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, what, I, what I'm loving about this conversation, Brad, is, I mean, you know, the, the podcast is, it's biblical, practical, spiritual. Some lean more on the practical side, some lean more on the spiritual. Man, I feel like biblically, this has been such a shot in the arm of just faith and of great just theology and and like the fact is like you can just tell that it's it's in you like yeah it it just comes out of you like a deep well of just this passion for the scripture this passion for good theology this passion for sharing the truth of who god is and it it comes out in your songs it comes out in your conversation um man i'm i'm inspired i'm challenged right now and uh i i know everyone listening is is uh is probably just like chewing on a lot of this meat because it's just, it's been so good today, man. Let me, let me ask you one final question in our, in our remaining time. Um, that's a question I love asking worship pastors is, is man, what is the Lord speaking to you right now? What's the Holy spirit, uh, just resonating in your heart. Maybe it's a word for such a time as this, that that can really encourage us today, man. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, something I've shared with a lot of people lately is I just, I believe more and more now 
the more I read scripture, the more I lead, the more I'm in different rooms, that our role as worship leaders, my role as a worship leader is to be moved by the scriptures and then share what moves me. Wow. Um, I think we can't, we can't mm. be people who hold out bread and say, eat, yet never take a bite ourselves. Wow. <laughs> and I think so often you have worship leaders who do that uh, for whatever reason. And um, that's not mm. broad brush. That's not saying that everybody does it. And I'm not saying I'm the only one that gets it right. I know that's not true because I know you get it right. And I know that, you know, there's, there's tons of people who, who love the word and sing the word and share the word. And it's just like it mm. oozes out of them. And that's been inspiring to me. But I just, I think that there's such a hunger for truth today. The culture does not take a day off in catechizing our people. You're true. And yeah. we should not take a day off in uh, equipping ourselves on how to combat the culture on behalf of our people so that our people might be equipped as well. Mm. And so when we're, when we're sitting down to read Scripture, we have to be, uh, we have to be immovable until we eat. It's almost like a, for me, like I've, all my kids are under eight. We say often, do not get up until you eat. Get back to the table. You haven't finished. <laughs> Go back to the That's table good. and eat. <laughs> yep. I think we have to have that mindset. Sit down, open your scripture, and that's you coming to the table of God, and do not get up until you've eaten. Be nourished. Uh, feed your soul, and then get up, and then go about your day. Um, but also in, your, in, in the planning, uh, be moved by scripture and then share what moves you. I love that. Be moved by the scripture and share what moves you. Brett, dude, you're just wise beyond your years, man. Wise beyond your years. And um, I appreciate just the the depth of this conversation. I appreciate your heart. And I love what you guys are putting out at Journey. We're going to put a bunch of links to uh, not just their website and uh, Instagram, but like how you can listen to some of these songs. They've got yeah. a lot of resources, praise charts and multi-tracks and everything. And yeah. um, dude, we're excited to uh, kind of dive in deeper to what Journey Worship is up to, man. Brett, we love you, bro. Thank you for the time, man. Love you too, bro. Thank you for what you're doing. I think this is a super helpful podcast. Um, just all the all the people that you have on here have so much wisdom and uh, it's a it's a great resource. So thanks for having me. I appreciate that. You've been listening to Worshipology with Curtis Parks, brought to you by Waves Custom. To learn more and find resources for your worship team, visit curtisparks.com.